Hello again in cellular injury. We are at the third part of this lecture, which is cellular death. We're going to start with uh, necrosis, which is the first type of cellular death. Now, um, if you have seen the previous video, we're going to remember this. Before a cell becomes necrotic, it may be under a reversible kind of injury that would give the cell different morphological appearance. Now, it is essential to differentiate between the morphology of reversibly damaged cell and a necrotic cell. So this is a very basic fact, you know the H and E stain, just a reminder that it contains hematoxylin, which stains basophilic structures blue, and eosin, which stains eosinophilic structures red. Now this is a normal slide from, taken from the kidney tubules, okay? These are viable epithelial cells, everything is normal here. We're going to compare this with the morphology of a, a reversibly injured cell and the morphology of a necrotic cell. Now this is basically what happens in reversible injury. We're going to start with having cellular swelling with hydropic changes with or without an overall swelling of the organ. Why does swelling happen? The answer is in the previous video, which is a mechanism of cell injury. Also, we're going to notice some fatty changes. These fatty changes are going to manifest as lipid vacuoles. Clumping of chromatin is also going to happen, as you can see here. And lastly, myelin figures. They only can be seen on using electron microscopy, but they are basically figures derived from the damaged cellular membrane. Now, this is the morphology of a necrotic cell, and we have cytoplasmic changes and nuclear changes. In the cytoplasm, we're going to have increased eosinophilia. That means increased redness of the cytoplasm. And why does this happen? We have RNA, and RNA is basophilic. That means it stains blue. And another thing that increased the redness is the binding of eosin to denatured proteins that would intensify the color of eosinophilia. Second is the glassy cytoplasm. You know that the cytoplasm in normal situations is not homogeneous because it contains a lot of things, including glycogen particles. Now, when a cell is necrotic, it loses all of its glycogen, and then you end up with more homogeneous looking uh, cytoplasm that we call glassy cytoplasm. And lastly, myelin figures, and we already know what these are. Nuclear changes are really easy. This is a simplified way of looking at the nuclear changes, these are three, karyolysis, pycnosis, and karyorexis. The way I used to remember these is a little bit embarrassing, but I'm going to explain it anyway. So first, the word karyo means nucleus. The second part of this word, lysis, you know that the word lysis means, you know, degradation. Okay, so the, the nucleus is going to fade, it's going to be degraded by all of these enzymes. Secondly, pycnosis. Now, how do you remember pycnosis? I'm sorry for the example. This is how I used to remember it. Imagine that this nucleus here is a person who's not really hygienic and who would pick their nose. Pycnosis. Pick their nose. So, imagine that a pers another person walks in the room while this nucleus is picking its nose and this nucleus would feel ashamed and it would shrink of shame and embarrassment. So, pycnosis is basically nuclear, nuclear shrinkage, okay? Lastly, karyorexis. These four letters, you can see them in the word diarrhea and rhinorrhea. And words like that, they mean flow. So, it's basically something that follows pycnosis usually, and it means nuclear fragmentation and the and the nucleus is going to end up floating inside the cytoplasm. This is a necrotic cell. It could actually persist for some time. It could be digested by all of the enzymes it releases or the enzymes of inflammation around it. And lastly, it can be replaced by myelin figures. Now, what's the fate of myelin figures? Remember that membranes are uh, composed of phospholipids and these phospholipids can be actually degraded into fatty acids and fatty acids would bind to calcium and now calcification here is a, a very important sign of necrosis maybe what i'm going to say now is a little bit advanced for you sometimes when we want to diagnose cancer we're going to use x-rays and when we x-ray a malignant mass sometimes this mass is so big that the core of this mass becomes necrotic 
Now, when this necrosis happens, sometimes there would be an end result of calcification. And we know that calcium can be seen on x-rays, so sometimes when we see calcification, it becomes more suggestive that we're dealing with a malignancy. Now we're going to talk about patterns of necrosis. I'm not going to stay in the slide, I just wanted to show you that these are not that bad. They can be combined together and they are easy to remember. The first pattern is coagulative necrosis. This is the most common pattern of necrosis. This is a kidney, okay? And this kidney is supplied by a, a number of arteries going to uh, different regions, right? Imagine that this region, this necrotic region, did not receive any blood supply. This supply is cut. This is called ischemia. I'm sure you remember the word ischemia it means the loss of blood supply. Now, because this is necrosis caused by ischemia, we're going to call it ischemic necrosis. And any area of ischemic necrosis can be called infarction. Coagulative necrosis is a characteristic of infarction. And it's basically the infarction of any solid organ that would give you coagulative necrosis except for the brain. The brain is the only solid organ that does not undergo the pattern of coagulative necrosis when it gets infarction, okay? So what happens here? Basically, the underlying tissue architecture is preserved. And as you can see here, this is a slide showing you the normal tubules here and the infarcted area. And you can see that these necrotic, these are basically necrotic cells, but they do have the same architecture. When you touch this, you're going to find that this is very, very firm. Okay, so because of the enzymes of proteolysis, they are denatured. Why? Because you have lost the blood supply. So the enzymes themselves that would usually degrade the necrotic cells are not really working. So you have a preservation. It may actually stay like this for weeks. And the cellular debris is going to be removed by phagocytosis. The second kind of necrosis is liquefactive necrosis. It happens in two situations. When you have an infarction in, t in the central nervous system and when you, when you have a bacterial or fungal infection. You can see in this picture that this tissue looks very, very liquidy. Basically, the microbes are going to stimulate the accumulation of leukocytes and their enzymes would digest or liquefy the tissue. So in, in this case, blood supply is not lost and white blood cells can actually reach the area very, very fast. And we end up with a creamy yellow material called pus, something that oozes out of certain bacterial or fungal infections. And at the end, the digested tissue is removed by phagocytosis as well. The third pattern is gangrenous necrosis. It's basically coagulative necrosis with liquefactive necrosis. Coagulative necrosis means it's an infarction, right? So you have loss of blood supply. But what happens here is that bacteria find this very, very habitable place to grow because there are no white blood cells to fight them. That means that you're going to end up with liquefactive necrosis as well, and we call it gangrene. And it's a lymph that has lost its blood supply with superimposed bacterial infection, basically. The third pattern is caseous necrosis. This word means cheese-like. You can see from the picture, it looks like cheese. Okay, so you have friable yellow-white appearance of the area of necrosis. And when you touch it, it's not really firm like coagulative necrosis. Okay, when you remember the word caseous, remember three words. First, cheese-like. Second, granuloma. Third, tuberculosis. Caseous necrosis is very, very characteristic to certain diseases. You're going to learn later. So it's basically a loss of architecture uh, confined in a border of inflammation that we call granuloma. And you can see the rest of the lung tissue uh, not being affected by this necrosis. This is basically happens when you have tuberculosis. The fifth pattern is fat necrosis. And this is also very characteristic. Remember that the most common one was cognitive necrosis, the rest are really characteristic to certain diseases. So fat necrosis happens when you have um, destruction of fat cells that would release a lot of fatty acids that would combine with calcium and would produce grossly visible chalky white areas that we would call this eventually fat saponification. When you look at this under 
microscopy, you're going to see a lot of foci of necrosis that would contain shadowy outlines of necrotic fat cells with basophilic calcium deposits. And a good example for this is acute pancreatitis. The pancreas is in the abdominal cavity, which is filled with mesenteric fat. So you're going to have degradation of this fat by the pancreatic lipases are released into the peritoneal cavity are going to end up with saponification. Lastly, fibrinoid necrosis, which is also very, very um, uncommon kind of necrosis, uh, which is very characteristic to certain diseases. It happens in polyarthritis nodosa. Okay, what happens here, this is an autoimmune disease when you have an antigen and antibody reacting with each other that would form immune complexes and they are going to deposit in the walls of arteries. Now what, what's in the walls of arteries? You have a lot of fibrin. So fibrin is going to bind to this, these immune complexes and are going to end up with pink and amorphous appearance that we call fibrinoid, which is this area. Okay, so this is basically a blood vessel. This is an artery. This is the lumen, which is filled with red blood cells. This is basically blood. And this is the, the fibrinoid necrosis in the wall of the artery. So we're done with necrosis.